gosh, it got quiet really fast. You guys make me nervous. Sheesh. I think Dr. Hayden said it well. It's like we're in a library. <laughs> uh, welcome. I'm Lee Ann Potter. I direct educational outreach here at the Library of Congress. And welcome to this very, very special day. It's special for a number of reasons. For starters, it's special because it's here at the Library of Congress. And as many of you know, the library is the largest library in the world. But did you know, and I've got good notes here, did you know that the library's collections contain almost 164 million items in a wide variety of formats, languages, and subjects? And did you know that these collections are the single most comprehensive accumulation of human expression ever assembled? And if that doesn't give you goosebumps, then maybe the weather did. <laughs> the collections are broad. They are broad in scope, and they include materials in more than 470 different languages, more than 35 different scripts, and many different media formats, from photographs to maps to drawings to manuscripts to sound recordings and more. The collections even include books. I say that because sometimes we assume um, and not the others. Today's event, though, is also special because we are here in the members room, uh, not your typical meeting room, huh? The members room in the Thomas Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress is a good reminder to all of us that the Library of Congress is the main research arm of the United States Congress. And today is extra special because today's event is not the kind of event that happens every day. In fact, it only happens once every two years. Today, as you know, we are inaugurating the new National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, who will serve in this position until January of 2020. As you probably know, an ambassador is someone who is authorized to be a representative or a messenger of something. A great ambassador is smart, knows what he or she is talking about, is a champion of an important cause, and is a supporter and a promoter of others. Hmm. You could almost say that the Librarian of Congress is an ambassador of sorts. I am honored to introduce you to Dr. Carla Hayden, the 14th Librarian of Congress. She earned her PhD from the University of Chicago. She began her career as a children's librarian. She led the Pratt Library in Baltimore, was the president of the American Library Association, and is absolutely aware of the power of reading. She knows the magic of a good story and is a tremendous ambassador for the Library of Congress. Dr. Hayden. Well, good morning and thank you, Leanne. I was all ready to sprint up and you started doing what my mom always loves to hear. <laughs> they never tire that, Jackson. They never tire that. Um, this is a, a wonderful event and just want to say welcome. I'm especially happy to see the young people from Brooklyn Middle School, the Orange, and their wonderful shirts, the Orange 6th grade and Teal 7th grade. So you should know that. And that, and so welcome and we hope you come back many, many times. One of the many pleasures of being Librarian of Congress is to host events like this. I have to say though, this one is very, very special. The inauguration of our new National Ambassador for Young People's Literature is Jacqueline Woodson. Now I've been a fan of Ms. Woodson's for a long time. And in my tenure at the Enoch Pratt Free Library, I was very fortunate to work with someone who was, talk about an ambassador, a champion, uh, a mentor for young people's literature, Ms. Deborah Taylor. She had been an advocate and still is for respecting young people 
by giving them the best in literature. And being the person who also was able to spot talent early on. She was the one, and her, uh, the young youth ambassador, Jean Yang, I remember when she said, oh my God, Carla, he's going to be the youth ambassador, and this, and she'd been following him. And then Jacqueline Woodson, in 2004, Deb Taylor selected Muriel's, uh, Miracle's Boys, and I have my copy, to be Baltimore's book. And the library purchased copies for all young people in the city. And this was the book in 2003. She also, and I'm going to embarrass her a little bit, was the person who gave Tupac Shakur his first award. <laughs> he won at 16. Deb Taylor took her car and picked up Tupac Shakur at home. He was 14 to attend, and young people, please don't laugh. There was a, a boogie to the book beat contest. <laughs> you should see their faces, like, boogie? Yes, a library rap contest, right? It was the 80s. It was the 80s. We were all boogieing. Michael Jackson, it was boogie, OK? And Deb Taylor had a library rap contest. At, and, and she picked up young Tupac Shakur in her car. He was 14. And he performed his library rap, which is now in a vault <laughs> at the library, because it's in his own hand about the library is cool. And, that, and he won the contest. And he also was very smart because it put a C for copyright on it. <laughs> so Deb Taylor, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because... <laughs> now I mentioned Gene because he's here with us today. And thanks to John Cole, the center for the book, we've had five, and this will be the fifth, uh, six youth ambassadors, and I want to thank John Cole for having the vision to say that this is something that the Library of Congress should do, and also showing that respect for our young scholars who are coming up. So John, we thank you for that. So we are so fortunate to have the Children's Book Council's support and Every Child a Reader Foundation support. You have been wonderful to help the library uh, expand this reach. And Jean, I have to tell you, I have samples of graphic novels from the Folger Library and from other places that we'd love to see the Library of Congress do. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to still use it. So please, let me hand this back over to um, Leanne. But thank you, thank you all for being here. Dr. Hayden mentioned that Jean is here, but sitting next to Jean is also one of our national ambassadors, John Cheska. I think Jean and John ought to just stand up, please. I think, he, I think she slipped in the other door. I think that's marvelous. Oh, so thank you, Dr. Hayden. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to welcome Carl Lennertz up here to the podium. Carl is the executive director of the Children's Book Council and of Every Child a Reader. He is busy. He oversees the development and expansion of both organizations' programming. And that programming includes a few things you've probably heard before. How about Children's Book Week? <laughs> and the Children's Choice Book Awards, as well as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Carl, come on up. I have a BA in psychology. <laughs> <laughs> then I went straight to work in a bookstore, and that was my education. But thank you all. OK, who likes magic? Good answer. 
no, John, not that one. No, no, no. All right. Give me three to four minutes to say some thank yous, and then I have a magic trick. Shane is going, oh, no. Um, thank you to all the young people here from the Brooklyn Middle School to the school librarian. Thank you very much for doing this. But the room is full of a lot of other young people, um, adults who are young at heart, young at spirit, and we are that way every day because we read, write, illustrate, publish, and share books with children and teens every day, and that keeps us young at heart, and that's a joyful thing. Uh, we say we go to work, we love going to work, it is work, but it's a joy every day to do our work to bring books to young people everywhere. Um, so I want to take a moment, my minute and a half or so, or two or three, to talk about the hundreds of thousands of people every day who bring books to readers everywhere. Uh, some of us here today and watching on live stream, not too nervous, uh, book publishers who discover talented writers, print their works and get them to readers. There's a lot more than that, but I only have five minutes. Um, the book publishers also support the work of Children's Book Council and Every Child a Reader, including the Ambassador Program. Thank you all here today. Thank you for the board members who made it. And thank you for all the Children's Book Council members watching at, all, at work. Uh, some of us here today are librarians, those amazing, amazing people in every town and city in America. I'm a library kid from a small town. I went there every day uh, bringing books to kids and adults everywhere. A special thanks to the superhero of librarians. I'm going to get you a cape. <laughs> Dr. Hayden, the Library of Congress, thank you. Um, and your staff, you've been great to work with. Leanne, Karen, Gail, Benny, all of you, it's been a joy. Thank you so much. Uh, another librarian is here, Star Electronica from Vermont. Thank you for coming down. <clears throat> she was on our selection committee, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Some of us here are independent booksellers, for real, former, present, and uh, in spirit. Those passionate people who, with librarians in a the community, they're the roots. They're in touch with everybody in America, more than all of us can ever be. Hundreds of thousands of booksellers and librarians who read the books ahead of time and reach to the heart and soul of communities across America. Uh, we would not have the country we have now, the diverse spirit, the talent, the literature, without independent booksellers and librarians. We have an independent bookseller here, Deandra Beard. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and for being on that call with us. It was wonderful. Okay, this one's underlined because I went to public school. Uh, to the teachers here today and everywhere, I consider your professions as important to the health and well-being of our kids and to us as much as doctors and nurses. Public school teachers rock. So do college teachers. We have two of them here, Sarah Park Dahlin, who is on our selection committee. Thank you for coming in. And so, oh, all right, okay, okay. Um, and Susanna Richards, who is a children's art illustration guru, historian, friend of CBC, and just a good idea person, and a friend of us in general. Um, to the media here today, thank you for helping to protect the free flow of information every day. Without you, we're in trouble. Um, to others here, yep, thank you. And who review, review books, very important. To others here at home doing the important work of getting books and stories to those in need every day, from first book to Sesame Workshop, Screen Free Week to the Little Library Movement, which is awesome, from Open Book to the PTA, and more organizations and charities and uh, places that I can name that just work with us, ALA, ABA, ABC. It's an acronym world, <laughs> but you all every day uh, getting books to people who need books, which is important. I'm coming to the end. I'm here on behalf of my small but passionate and wonderful team back in New York, Laura Perez, Shefa Kapadwala, Ryan Mita, and Callie Graham. I know you haven't got water in the office, but you're huddled around the coffee machine, and uh, oh, it's, been, it's been rough. Um, and for two people here, who I'm going to embarrass, Audra Bolton, our publicity guru, who made all the interviews happen. Thank you. Um, and for Jacqueline, for your time giving the interviews, they were just so wonderful. It's stressful. I mean, it's saying something different to each person, but thank you for doing that. We got major coverage across the country with the Library of Congress. I, I think we're talking about a $100 million media impression story about books, reading, love of books. It was wonderful. And Shana Burkhead, my Director of Programs and Partnership. <laughs> you, I'll give you the, you're here in two years doing this, okay? She's 
does so much, and I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. And now to the magic. No, not my trick, just a second. To the magic makers, the writers, illustrators everywhere who create the word and picture stories that delight us every day. Um, and yes, talking back to the young at heart thing, John Cheska, you make me smile every time I see you. Your books make me smile. Gene Yang, you brought me back to the world of comic books. I left that world, Shadow Hero brought me back. Thank you. And Jacqueline Woodson, what a gift to the world you are. You teach us, you guide us, you make us wiser, better, stronger. Um, the, the selection committee's work this summer was just the coolest phone call ever. Um, it was just all about the love of books and art and illustration, and uh, the highlight of the last year was your selection as the ambassador. We're happy for you, your family, for us, and mostly for the young people you'll reach with your message and energy and the power of storytelling. Um, thank you, all of you in the Children's Book World. You make a difference every day. We'll see you again soon in Children's Book Week, the first week in May, the National Festival of Book. Jackie's on the road talking, selling her books, doing her thing, and, and doing for us along the way. All right, time for my magic deck. I am going to disappear back to my seat <laughs> and let the real magic makers take the stage. Thank you, Carl. Very nice. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to be reminded that I'm shorter than Carl. <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to welcome Jean Yang to the stage, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him just in case you didn't know. For the past two years, Jean has served as the fifth national ambassador for young people's literature. He was born and raised in California and is the son of Chinese immigrants. He has been drawing comics since the fifth grade. In 2006, his book, American Born Chinese, was published and it became the first graphic novel to be nominated for a National Book Award. And it was the first to win the American Library Association's Prince Award. In 2013, his two-volume graphic novel about the Boxer Rebellion, entitled Boxers and Saints, was nominated as well for a National Book Award and won the LA Times Book Prize. In addition, and I could go on, but in addition to cartooning, he is also a teacher. He is currently teaching creative writing, and he has been a tremendous national ambassador. His platform, Reading Without Walls, has challenged all of us to stretch our reading habits in very important ways. Jean. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here. Two years ago in the same building, in a different room, but the same building, uh, I, I got the fanciest thing that I own. I got the, the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature medal from the Library of Congress, from Every Child a Reader, from the Children's Book Council. And the last two years have been among the most amazing of my life. I want to thank Dr. Hayden and Carl and Shane and everyone else for all of your support. I want to especially thank the librarians and the teachers and the booksellers that have made these past two years so magical. For the last two years, I've gotten to go around the country to talk to young people from all different communities in America. And what I've discovered is that kids love books. Despite what some adults might lead you to think, kids still love books. And they love books for the same reason we all love books. It's because stories help us make sense of our lives. Stories help us make sense of the world. And that's why I am so excited to be here today. Because today, we all in this room, we get to witness one of the greatest storytellers of our time receive the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Medal. Um, Jackie Woodson is one of my heroes. Um, she is a person that I deeply admire. I admire her not just as a writer, but also as a human being. And in many ways, I believe that her ambassadorship is simply going to be an extension of the work she's already doing. If you have had the pleasure of reading one of Jackie's books, if you've had the pleasure of sitting in on one of her speeches, you know that through her words, whether they're spoken into a microphone or written on a page, she teaches us 
about the world. She helps us make sense of life and make sense of the world. Her, her words bring us hope. Her words bring about change. Like I said, she's one of my heroes. And if she isn't one of yours yet, give her a few minutes. Wait till she gets up here. <laughs> She'll be one of yours too. Thank you all so much for being here. I know you all are just as excited as me to celebrate Ambassador Jacqueline Woodson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Um, and thank you for your last two years, really. I asked Jean to stay here with me, and now I'm gonna ask Dr. Hayden to join us, because we're gonna start telling you really cool things about Jackie. <laughs> Jacqueline Woodson is the author of more than two dozen award-winning books for young adults, middle graders, and children. Her books address important topics, such as bullying, and kindness, incarceration, identity, mixed race experiences, and much more. Among her many accolades, she is a four-time Newbery Honor winner, a three-time National Book Award finalist, and a two-time Coretta Scott King Award winner. For some specifics, Jean, or Dr. Hayden, either way. <laughs> In 2014, she received the National Book Award for her New York Times best-selling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming. You all read this book? If you haven't read this book, you should feel a little ashamed. It's an amazing book. Which was also a recipient of the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Honor, the NAACP Image Award, and the Cybert Honor. In 2015, uh, Jacqueline Woodson was named the Young People's Poet Laureate by the Poetry Foundation, and some of her other books include The Other Side, Each Kindness, Coming on Home Soon, Feathers, Show Way, After Tupac and Dee Foster, and Miracles Boys. She is also <laughs> the recipient of the Margaret Alexander Edwards Award for Lifetime Achievement for her contributions to young adult literature, the winner of the Jane Addams Children's Book Award, and was the 2013 United States nominee for the Hans Christian Andersen Award. And this March, Penguin Young Readers will celebrate the 20th anniversary of her If You Came Softly with a special edition of the adored story of star-crossed love between a black teenage boy and his Jewish classmate. And later this year, <laughs> The Dream of America, a middle grade novel written by Woodson and The Day You Begin, a picture book also written by Woodson and illustrated by Rafael Lopez will be published. But today, should we get a drum in here? <laughs> she officially becomes the sixth national ambassador for young people's literature. Dr. Hayden's gonna make it official as soon as Jackie gets up here and places the medallion around her neck. The Olympics. Uh -huh. <laughs> awesome. Get a threesome. Okay, our photographer's right there waiting for a great picture, and then I'm gonna get out of it. Okay. Now view three. Oh. oh. Nice. Okay, Sean, do you need any other shots? You're good. 
All right, excellent. Now, Jacqueline and Dr. Hayden are gonna have a little conversation. And about 10 minutes into the conversation, Jacqueline's gonna come up here and make some remarks, especially for all of us. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience, starting with our students from Brookland Middle School. Thanks. Oh. Well, this is just an honor for all of us and a special pleasure. Yay! Special, <laughs> special pleasure. Uh, yes, my copy. Yes, my copy. Just saying. Uh, but you have been such an inspiration. Oh, so have you, Dr. Hayden. Now, Thank you. I remember my favorite book was called Bright April. And it was the first time that I could see myself in a book. A little girl, she was brown, she had pigtails, all of that. And you talk about not seeing yourself reflected. And that's why Miracle's Boys was one of the books that people said, wow, I see myself. What's that mean to see yourself? Um, well, I think it's so important, uh, looking back on the work of Dr. Redeem Sims Bishop, who talks about the importance of young people having both mirrors and windows. So they have books where they can look in and see a brown girl or a, uh, a young Latin boy or an Asian girl um, and see some part of their identity in the book. And that's a mirror and it makes them aware of their presence in a bigger world. And I think um, we also talk about books having windows so you see into other worlds. And for me as a young person growing up, I had many, many windows <laughs> into white worlds and very few books where um, young kids of color were reflected on the pages until I think one of the earliest books I remember reading was Virginia Hamilton's, um, oh, which Virginia, ha Zealy. Oh. And Zealy, and, and it was about two kids and they were going down south and there was so much of me on the page. And another one was Mildred Taylor's Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Mm. Uh, and it was so eye-opening to see a reflection of myself and Cassie and, and suddenly realize that there I was on the page and that I could be on the page. And not only could I be on the page, but I could, be a, I could grow up to be a woman of color who wrote because here was Mildred Taylor, here was Virginia Hamilton, who were um, women of color telling stories. So I think it's it legitimizes us in this way that we don't realize um, our absence until we see that presence on the page. Now you mentioned wanting to write and seeing you could write. How young were you when you said, boy, I like this writing. <laughs> Reading, but writing, and I want to yeah. produce. I, I've known I wanted to write since I was seven. And I remember as a young person loving the physical act of writing, of holding a pencil and seeing that putting letters together made words and words made sentences and sentences made paragraphs and that writing was just that organic. You know, all you needed was that pencil and that paper and an imagination and the, story, the rest was there. You didn't need any expensive paraphernalia to be able to create art. Wow, now I'm turning to the students the here. <coughs> terms of paraphernalia and things like that because there are so many distractions and, and things. And so uh, people have said, you know, reading is disappearing and, and what's going on with young people? What do you? <laughs> I don't think, I, I think we see fewer books sometimes, but I don't think people are not reading. I think sometimes we have to wrestle them and get their <laughs> paraphernalia <laughs> out of their hand and remind them of the glory of reading. But I think, um, as Jean said, young people love story and they love to be engaged that way. And, um, and there, there are many ways in which we read. So I think even though we're not always seeing them with a book in their hand, sometimes they have a book in their ear. Sometimes they're reading on a tablet. Sometimes someone is telling them a story. Sometimes they're creating a story in their head some way. So um, I think it's definitely gotten more challenging, but, but we're a country that has always had to shift. And so we figure out ways of engaging people where they are. And if, they, if they're in a world where there's a lot of technology, then what are we going to do to shift them toward reading? How do we engage with that technology to get them 
um, where they're engaging with narratives. Poetry as another way, uh, a gateway mm -hmm. into that. Now, when did you start with poetry as another extension of that? You know, I didn't, I, I was very afraid of poetry when I was a kid. I always um, thought it was this kind of secret code um, that I wasn't meant to understand. And it wasn't until, I remember hearing an album, my mom was playing this album and it was Nikki Giovanni. And so it was early spoken word and I was like, what is that? And I think it was my sister who said, you know, that's Nikki Giovanni, that's poetry. And I'm like, no, that's not. Like, I understand that, that's not poetry. And, and then later on, writers like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay and all of these poets who suddenly were speaking a language I understood unlocked it so that I could begin to understand other poets, um, the more kind of um, incomprehensible poets. Right. Um, but poetry, you know, I, I learned to do the work of deconstructing poetry because I had the gateway into people like Langston Hughes and, um, you know, um, and Nikki Giovanni. Audre Lorde, um, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Angela Will Grimke, and so many of the writers who helped me figure that out. I remember my grandmother was uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And it was, how could you do the dialect? And she said, I know it. I know. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. I know what we this is. We had a great big potty in the house right. the other night. Yeah, he, right. I love him. Right. <laughs> Now, Tupac, we mentioned, and, and rap is another way. Or, or yeah, he, he was an amazing poet. I mean, Tupac, when you look at the rose that grew from con concrete, and um, just the, he was not only a poet, he was an activist. And I think that's what was so phenomenal about him and so many of the young people who were rapping. They were, they were telling stories, they were telling history, they were breaking down where we are in the moment, and they were doing it in a way, going back to shifting where young minds could understand what they were trying to say. And they were asking big questions, and I think that's what all good literature does, is ask questions of the reader, of the listener, about the moment they're in. Speaking of the moment, your platform, reading equals hope and change for your time. How do you see that? evolving because this is a interesting time to be an ambassador to work with young people to ask questions to answer questions so reading equals hope times change is um, the platform that I came up with that we came up with that speaks to the fact that reading does allow, we, we go into a book because we're hopeful for something. We're hopeful for a good story. We're hopeful to meet some mirrors on the page. We're hopeful for um, great characterization. Um, and when we come out of a book, we're different. And, and that difference is because we've met the writer halfway. And I'm gonna talk more about this in my very short talk after this. But, um, I think that books can change us. They can help us begin to have the bigger conversations. Um, they can help us see worlds and um, identities and ideas that we never thought about before until they've been brought to the page and we've met them on the page. And so I think we come out of a book different than we were when we went in it. Now, one of the questions I had here that you've been applauded and criticized for tackling tough issues, uh, getting back to respecting young people that they can handle discussions mm -hmm. about tough issues. They're looking to books sometimes to help them through it where they don't have foster care, incarceration. Mm -hmm. And why is that important that we have it? Uh, I think the first thing is I'm not trying to hear the haters, so. <laughs> You know, they, at, from the beginning of time, people who have had, listen to this. who've tried to um, create change have been blasted against, right? Um, and I think it's because people are afraid. Uh, when we look at the issue of mass incarceration in our country, I think it's a sin not to talk to, not to speak to it, and not to let the young people who have, who know, um, who have people who have been in their families, in their lives, who are incarcerated, let them know that they're not alone on that journey and, and that there is nothing wrong with their family makeup. And there is nothing, you know, the, it, when I wrote Visiting Day, um, 
it was because I had grown up with my uncle in prison. And, and it was this kind of thing we weren't supposed to talk about. And I never understood where the shame came from. And looking at it now, again, going back to mass incarceration, how can we try to hide something that's so visible in our society? And if we don't talk about it, we can't begin to change it. Um, we can just kind of make believe it doesn't exist. And so I think um, any writer who's going to try to have harder conversations is going to get criticized. I remember writing um, If You Come Softly, um, where uh, you know, an African-American boy gets killed by cops in a case of mistaken identity. People, well, I remember people saying this would never happen. You know, and this was 20 years ago. Um, and, and at some point, you're kind of questioning your own reality because you think, oh, maybe, maybe this doesn't happen, but you know it does. And that kind of um, gaslighting can happen when you don't have the proof on, of books and experiences in the world so that you can go to that book and say, yeah, you know, I'm not alone in this. Yeah, I was right in thinking about that because someone else is thinking this too. And, and young people can see it and, mm -hmm. and discuss it. And they can handle it. Mm -hmm. I think they can too. Now, you also said, brilliance is passion recognized, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful phrase. And in terms of encouraging young readers and young authors and young poets, mm -hmm. that they see that. Yes, that they know. I think it's so important. I mean, I was talking to my Brookland friends, and we were talking about their talents. and. Um, and their plans for going to Duke Ellington and, and what they do. Um, and it is, I think, that sometimes people think there's just one way to be brilliant. There's maybe only academic brilliance. Or, um, but I think there is, there, our brilliance is our passion recognized and, and celebrated, right? When I, I know that I'm kind of a good writer. And, and, um, and it's nice because it's also what I love to do. And I think because I love to do it, I want to do it the best that I possibly can. And I remember having a teacher who said, when you choose a career, choose something you love doing because you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. Okay. And I think that those words stayed with me because I thought, hopefully, I would live a long life. And, and the idea of waking up every day and being unhappy with the work you're doing was heartbreaking to me. And so, so I honed the thing that I felt was my brilliance and worked at it until it became the thing I wanted it to be in the world, the stories I wanted to tell. And I think everyone has that. Everyone has that thing that they're really good at, that they really love doing. And our work as adults is to not kill that fire. Um, your work as young people is to not let that fire get murdered. Um, and, and then we get to see all of that brilliance in the world um, in a way that transforms it and transforms us. Can writing help with that? As you've said, uh, look through moments in time into a more hopeful place about writing or expressing it, music, or some other way. I think writing can help with everything. <laughs> I think writing is like is the bomb. Um, <laughs> I think you know, I talk about writing because I have questions, and I do think that there is a way when we can sit and begin to figure out who we are and who we're becoming, and what the questions are we have through writing and through reading. So I, I, I believe deeply, deeply in writing, and I love when young people want to be writers because I know. I'm here because of Nikki Giovanni. I'm here because of Toni Morrison. I'm here because of Langston Hughes. I'm here because of Gwendolyn Brooks. And if they had not come before me, um, I wouldn't be here. And I feel like the same thing. The young people are here because of us, because of you know Jean, and because of John, and because of Catherine and me. And um, and let that circle be unbroken. You know, let people keep coming and telling their stories because now, I mean, y'all must have some amazing stories to tell about this moment in time. Whew. Oh, I see you're nodding. <laughs> Is, do we have time for a few? I think you've got some remarks. Remarks? Do you want to go ahead and then we'll respond to questions? How about that? Um, do you want okay. Yes. Okay. Jean has my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This one. <laughs> and I'm going to exit. 
Thanks, Dr. Hayden. So I'm not gonna be long because I am so much more interested in your questions. Maybe I'll answer a few of them and what I have to say, but um, I love when young people ask me questions. But I was told I needed to say something about becoming <laughs> ambassador. So is it still morning? Because I start with saying good morning. Okay. Oh, I have the lavalier, so it, um, people who are live streaming, is it okay? Is my sound okay? I'm good? I could keep using this? I could use both of them? Thank you. So it's an amazing honor to stand before you in the Library of Congress this morning. It's also an honor to be living in this time, to bear witness to our country's beautiful and complicated history and its immense possibility, because I do believe we're living in a time of great, great, great possibility. What an honor to follow the footsteps of groundbreaking ambassadors that came before me, Gene Yang, who is not only my absolute hero, so which makes me think he read my speech because he called me his hero. <laughs> But he's also a hero to both my children and to many children. Kate DeCamillo, who was the inspiration for us naming our cat Fred after Bink and Golly, <laughs> who never fails to make me laugh or make me choke up with each book she writes. Catherine Patterson, one of the kindest people I know. Walter Dean Myers, who came into this world and left it with his untimely passing, filled with a body of work that changed consciousnesses of so many young men and boys of color, and so many others as well. Um, I miss Walter. Walter, who during his time as national ambassador, tired of, tirelessly traveled and spoke to the many who had not thought of themselves as part of a bigger world or deeper narrative. And of course, our beloved pioneer, John Cheska, neighbor, friend, and awesome writer who is sitting among us this morning. I would not be here without y'all. First and foremost, I wanna thank the people who have worked beyond hard to bring me to this moment. The most fabulous Library of Congress and Dr. Carla Hayden, my sister from another mother <laughs> and history maker. My dear friend, Debbie Taylor, and all of my people at Enoch Pratt Library. It was here doing a reading, during, doing a reading from my first novel, Last Summer with Mason, that I rediscovered the breadth and depth of libraries. Readings, conversations, children's programs, programs for young mothers, adult literacy classes, passport renewals, puppet making, all of it was, is happening at the libraries. Enoch Pratt and nationwide. As I began to travel, I saw in every single state the enormity of what libraries, both large and small, had to offer anyone who stepped through their doors. I rediscovered that libraries aren't just for some people, they're for all people. I'd like to thank the Children's Book Council, Every Child a Reader, and the committee that chose me to succeed Jean, Deandra, Sarah, Earl, Travis, Star, and Ella, Ellen, and of course, Jean. I love your faith in me, and I'm grateful, I think, <laughs> for it. <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here without my Penguin family, my long-suffering editor, Nancy Paulson, Jen, Elise, Jocelyn, Felicia, Cecilia, and the rest of the crew. A writer writes in solitude and then steps outside of the solitude to get the help they need to shape their work into something that the rest of the world can understand. When I wrote Brown Girl Dreaming, there were 31 rewrites before it became the book so many of y'all have read. And then some tweaks between the first and second edition. So if you have that first edition, hold on. <laughs> My eyes in the world are my own eyes and the eyes of those who I trust deeply. Nancy, thank you for being my second set of eyes in the world. I am thankful too to my amazing family, my partner Juliet, our children Toshi and Jackson Leroy, 
and all of my sisters from other mothers, including Linda Villarosa, Jana Welch, Jane Sassine, and the ones who couldn't be here with us as well. There are a lot of them. Y'all be sitting here forever. <laughs> and I want to thank those who have been with me on this journey from it feels like the moment it began, including Katie Horning, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, Rita Auerbach, Dean Snyder. In this room with us this morning are those who guide us now as ancestors. Robin Smith, Virginia Hamilton, my mom and grandmother. Let us each take a moment and remember someone who has left this place for the next one, who continues from that place to walk with us. In the African American tradition, there is the calling of names, where we call our ancestors back into the room, where we acknowledge that because of them, we are. Let us take a moment and remember friends, loved ones, relatives, anyone we can think of, writers, um, who have left us and who remain important and call out their name. Thank you. Your world is as big as you make it. I know, for I used to abide in the narrowest nest in a corner, my wings pressing close to my side. But I sighted a distant horizon where the skyline encircled the sea, and I throbbed with a burning desire to travel this immensity. I battered the cordons around me and cradled my wings on the breeze, then soared with the uttermost reaches. I'm sorry, then soared to the other, uttermost reaches with rapture, with power, with ease. I wish I had written that poem, but I didn't. <laughs> it was written by the poet Georgia Douglas Johnson, who for more than 40 years hosted a salon right here in DC on Smith Street Southwest. For those of you who don't know, a salon is basically a gathering where you come and eat food, drink good wine and organic milk, young people. <laughs> read your work and read the work of others, maybe get a cipher going and share ideas about the world. And through the sharing of these ideas, you begin, begin to change your own way of thinking and the way others think. But it starts with gathering. Through Douglas's salon came some of the most influential writers of the Harlem Renaissance, from El Elaine Locke to Langston Hughes, from Angelina Weld Grimke to Jean Toomer, poets that I hope by the end of my tenure tenure as national ambassador, I'll know how to pronounce the word, and <laughs> we will all know them. Reading equals hope times change. When Georgia Douglas Johnson began those writing salons, no one knew that the Harlem Renaissance would take a very important place in history. No one knew that one day Mildred Taylor would write Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, that Jean Yang would write American Born Chinese, that Simon J. Ortiz would write The People Shall Continue, or Sherman Alexie would one day write The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. These books, these writers were decades away from that moment. Many were not even born yet. The people in Douglas' salon walked into that room with the books they were writing and the books they were reading. They walked into that salon with hope. They read, they talked, they laughed, they drank their wine and milk. They sang and they changed the world. Because of them, I am. Because of them, we are all gathered here. 
Yesterday, my family and I spent the day at the American Museum of African American History and Culture, again, right here in DC. It took over 100 years to make that mu museum a reality. First, it was dreamed. Then it was built. Then people opened their trunks and suitcases and books and pulled history of Amer African Americans in this country from the crevices into which that history was delicately and lovingly packed away. They knew a time would come when that history would need a home. Now is the time. As national ambassador, my hope is to begin conversations our country is hungry, but oftentimes afraid to have. Some days, this place feels like a country divided, a country in despair, a country hungry for a way out of no way. But what the books will tell us and continue to show us is that there is magic in this moment we're living in now. There is so much possibility, and to the young people gathered here today, that power to create change is in your hearts, in your heads, in your hands. I am often asked about my writing. When you write this book or that book, what were you trying to teach? And my answer is always the same. I don't write to teach, I write to learn. I write because I have so many questions that only I can answer, and the way I can answer them is by putting pen to paper. The only way I can find the hope I'm looking for in a particular moment is to put that hope on the page. And when I'm done, like many writers, my hope is then that the reader will meet me halfway, bring their own ideas and experiences and hope to the narrative I've created. So my hope for the next two years is that we come together in many rooms to talk, that we meet the authors halfway and talk about what our hopes are for the future, our equations, our plans for change, that we hold salons in classrooms, in libraries, in bookstores, in living rooms, around kitchen tables, in playgrounds, at hair salons, in barber shops. That we find the books that tell the stories we need to hear and use those stories to write the next chapter in this country's history. That re we remember there was a time when people were not allowed to learn to read because reading led to freedom. It's a lot of things to be in, it's a lot of things being in this room, at this podium, in front of all of you, in this moment in time. It's scary, it's thrilling, it's mind blowing, it's imagining the unimaginable. The writer, the activist, Audre Lorde said, we can sit in our corners mute as bottles and we will still be no less afraid. I believe that reading equals hope, hope times change. I believe that me plus you equals a conversation. I believe that hope minus fear equals change. I believe that listening plus hearing minus judgment equals friendship. These are just a few of my equations. In the next two years, I'm eager to gather and hear yours. did good. Thank you. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, now it's time for some questions, and my audiovisual team has told me that there are two mics that we can float around the room. If you've got one in your hand, would you let me see it? Awesome. Perfect. So how about one of you come over to this side, and one of you stay on that side, and then if you guys could raise your hands when you've got a question, we'll make sure you get the mic, and the reason we need to make sure you use the mic is so that our audience that's watching the live stream and our recording can hear your question, okay? All right. Yeah. And if you could say your name when you ask the question, that would be so helpful. My name is Christian Strickland. Hey, Christian. And um, what do you plan to do after your term is over? <laughs> 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 
Thanks, Christian. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I think it's going to go so fast, and I, I plan to rest. Um, I, you know, I, I, um, I don't plan to stop writing, because uh, I talked about how much I love writing. And I plan to be right here, all willing, uh, putting this medal on the next ambassador. Hi. OK. My name is Lucia Brisbane. My question is, OK, what do you plan to do while you're ambassador? Uh, so what do I plan to do while I'm ambassador? I plan to do a lot around trying to get people to gather. Um, I don't, one thing that you have to do as ambassador is you travel around the country. You, you legitimately only have to travel five times, right? <laughs> That, that was one of the promises of being ambassador. <laughs> um, but, but I think there are all kinds of ways to gather. I think we can Skype. I think people um, can um, come to book festivals. I think we can um, gather in classrooms. So I plan to help kind of um, get the conversation going from wherever I am. I hope to meet a lot of people. I hope to travel to a lot of juvenile detention centers and um, um, group homes and places like that to meet people who might not otherwise have met authors. I, we're, my family's going to Mississippi in April, so I'm planning to go to some of the place schools and libraries in rural Mississippi while I'm there. Um, and really, really just begin having the conversation that I hope will become a very nationwide conversation. This. My name is Cameron Jackson, and I was wondering who, do you guys have anybody in mind to be the next ambassador? <laughs> Cameron's already ready to push past me. He's like, he's like do y'all have someone in mind for the next ambassador? Cameron, I'm sure they're taking requests. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dion Odom, and my question is, how old were you when you published your first book? So um, my first book was Last Summer with Mason, and that was published when I was in my 20s, my early 20s. It took me about four years to write that book because I didn't know what I was doing. So unlike the many years it took me to write Brown Girl Dreaming when I thought I knew what I was doing, I just didn't know what I was saying. But, um, but it was finally published in my early 20s. The first book, that there was a book that was published before that. Um, that was really badly written by me and really badly illustrated by Floyd Cooper. Uh, and that book is not in existence anymore. Every time, sometimes a librarian will pull it out and say, I got that book. Um, but, but Last Summer with Mason was my first novel. Hi, my name is Justice Bell Perry. And my question is, out of all books that you have read and the characters that you have met in those books, what book? or character is most like you? Uh, that's such a great question. Oh my goodness. You know, I, it's so funny because I, I feel like the person that comes to mind that where I first said, that's me, was Cassie Logan in Role of Done to Hear My Cry. Um, you know, I feel like also um, Franny and Daddy was a number runner, and Fran um, Francis Nolan and a tree grows in Brooklyn. Like any time there was a girl around the age I was when I was reading it who had something. So for me, in a tree grows in Brooklyn, the mirror was Brooklyn because that's where I live. And so everything Brooklyn about that book, I was like, you know, I know this, even though it took place probably 40 years before I began reading it. Um, but I, I did, I did and still do find myself in so many characters. And they don't have to um, you know, be the same you know, as your preferred gender, right? I, find my, I found myself in characters like um, you know, Ghost, Jason Reynolds' book. Like I read that book, and I'm like, yeah, I was a runner. I, can, I could probably beat him. But um, <laughs> so it really, um, there were a lot of characters. My name is Jocelyn Howard, and my question is, have you ever thought about having another career instead of writing? Uh, uh, so I don't know if everyone heard Jocelyn's question, have I thought of having another career besides being a writer? Um, no, I don't think so. 
I would probably want to be a singer. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> My family's laughing because they've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yudira Hercules. Did you have a secret place to go when you wanted to write a story? Do I have a certain place to go? So once my family leaves the house, I'm usually writing at the kitchen table. But um, I tend to, I, I like writing downstairs in my office because it's quietest. Um, sometimes, every time I write, I put headphones on, so it helps me drown out the rest of the world. Um, so even though I don't have to physically leave a place, I do have to kind of cover up my ears so that noise isn't coming in. But I've been able to write on subways. I've been able to write um, in cafes. I've been able to write in libraries as long as I have my earphones on, because I don't want to hear other people's conversations. Hi, my name is Shakaya Wright. And did you ever expect to be the ambassador for Nationals Young People's Literature? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my, my name is Leah Redman, and my question is, did you have any challenges becoming an author, and how did you overcome them? You know, it's a good question. I always quote Katherine Patterson, who says um, the main rule of writing is BIC, right? Butt in chair. And, you know, because basically you have to be disciplined to be a writer. And, and I think the older I got and the more, there are more and more things that, um, as Dr. Hayden and I were talking about, there are more things that um, distract you from writing. And so as a young person, I didn't know writers. I didn't know that someone, I, it wasn't like now where you could actually meet a writer and hear them talk or go online and see them talk or even look at the back of the book and see their photo and know stuff about them. Um, it was a very different time, and writers seemed really far away, and something that was unattainable, something you couldn't do. Um, but for some reason, um, I knew I always wanted to do it, and I, I wasn't sure how I was going to. So I think the first huge challenge for me was faith, right? Believing that I could write these stories that might someday get published. Um, but in the process of writing the stories, I realized that writing made me happy. So even if they didn't one day get published, I loved writing them. Um, and then the big challenge was finishing stories. And then the big challenge was rewriting stories, because you write something and you think it's done, right, Jackson Leroy? And then, um, and then you realize you have to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And so that was a challenge. And then once realizing how rewriting made it a better story. But I think there are always going to be challenges. Um, and the question is, when you get to the challenge, what you do with it? Because there's always going to be the book that falls apart. And you could either just stop writing and start a new book which is going to fall apart, and you stop writing that one and start a new book, which is going to fall apart. Or you can push through when it's falling apart and get to the end of it. Because I, I ask my fellow authors, everything we write falls apart. And that's when we know the real work is about to get started. Hi, my name is Lauren. And my question is, how do you come up with the topics for your book? How do you come, I come up with the topics for my book? So there's a saying that if you, have, if you survive kindergarten, you have enough to write about for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I think it's true. I think so many things happen to us every day. And I'm sure um, John and Jean will tell you this. It's, it's hard to not write. It's hard not to find t uh, material. So you know, thoughts I have, conversations I have, sometimes things I read, sometimes other books inspire me, sometimes um, Questions I, a lot of times, it's the questions I have that I'm trying to figure out. When I wrote the book Feathers, that was actually inspired by a story called The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. Um, and the book was originally called The Jesus Boy, um, because that's what I call the, the main character in The Selfish Giant. And it began to change, but it was inspired by something I first read in the third grade. So I think that's where the whole, the longer you live, the more stories you have to write. Mm. Is there a specific theme What's or your name? oh justice? My name is Justice. Yeah. Is there a specific theme or topic in all of your books, or are they like different in each one? Uh, they're pretty different. I don't write um, series because uh, I get bored after like the second book. 
I've aspired to do it, and then um, I either kill the characters off or, <laughs> or, or have them move away or just let them have a happily ever after or something. But, um, but I do, I have, um, I write realistic fiction. So that's the genre. And I write it both um, in verse and as narrative. So, but, but usually my characters are different. I've written a trilogy. I've written books that have sequels. But um, that's about as long as I can get. I'm Dion, and my question is, out of all the books that you've written, which one is your personal favorite? Uh, you know, and I'm sure, again, my fellow ambassadors will say the same thing. I like them for different reasons. You know, I don't have a, f do you all have favorites? Yeah, I mean, because you, when you're writing it, it's, a, it's the experience you're having with the book. Um, and then sometimes if the book is really old, you get tired of it. So I have books I like less than other books, but I don't have a favorite yet. Last question. Okay. Want to jump right in? I, your questions have been terrific, kids. Okay. Carl. Oh, you need a mic, Carl. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. I don't actually be there you go. Uh, Carl, when you first started writing, did you show it to a friend? How, you seemed pretty confident, and you knew what you put was, on paper was good, but what was your first validation? And my point being, mm -hmm. if one of these people from Brooklyn starts writing, uh -huh. What would you tell them, just go ahead or show it to a friend? Well, I would say, it's a good question, what, who, who do you show your writing to? I think you show it to people you trust. Um, because um, there are two kinds of criticism, right? There's constructive criticism that makes you go running back to your work and want to make it better. And there's destructive criticism, which makes you just want to throw it away. And you want to show it to the people who are going to say, you know, I love, here's what, all the things I love about this book, and here are some of the questions I might have. You know, because that's helpful and that makes you want to go back to it, but if someone says, um, you know, I don't know, this sucks, or you know, you should never write again, like, that's destructive <laughs> criticism. Uh, I don't even know why you're writing that. Um, but, but one thing I do is I like, I always, um, think that it's really important when you have something new and you show it to someone you trust, just say to them, ask me three questions. Like, what three questions do you have? Um, you know, tell me something positive and ask me three questions. Oh, I love that character. I wonder why he went to the store in the corner. I wonder why um, he, he decided to do this. I wonder what's going to happen to him next. And that gets you excited and makes you want to the, write the next draft or add to it. So questions, not destructive criticism. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. All right. I think we're going to wrap things up. That was awesome. You have to stay right there for just okay. a minute so we can clap some more. Um, really, students from Brooklyn Middle School, thanks so much for the great questions. Thing. Yeah. So um, I am sorry. I just wanted to give a plug for We Need Diverse Books, which has changed the narrative of literature. Um, and I want to thank them for being in the room, even though they're not in the room. Outstanding. Okay. Well, I am confident that our young people's ambassador, um, our, our ambassador for young people's literature, is well on her way to making lots of friends in the next couple of years and getting all of us to think very thoughtfully about reading and writing and I really can't say enough. This has been a terrific conversation this morning and really so glad that all of you have been here. I have a couple more thank yous I want to extend. I want to make sure that my colleagues Karen Jaffe and Sasha Dowdy and Monica Valentine get a big high five. As well as all of the volunteers from our Young Readers Center, our multimedia team, our library photographer, Sean, and our special events person, Clay, who I don't see. But events like this at the library don't just happen magically. They happen when people come together and make things happen. And um, really, we are blessed at the library to have an amazing team of people who pull together events like this. So thank you to all of my colleagues um, for making today work. Mm -hmm. 
I want to make sure that as we leave, we ask the kids to go first. And I'd like you guys to kind of come around this way. You can give Jackie a high five as you walk by. And then our colleagues here have a special gift for you from Penguin. They are signed copies ooh, of one of Jackie's books. And if you haven't read it yet, I bet you will tonight. Awesome. Congratulations again, Jackie. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. We're off to a great year. <laughs> okay. All right, so kids, you can get started. Come on this way, and thank you all for joining us.